When I think of the word respond, I think of challenges that I faced growing up where I really have to either respond in a negative way or in a positive way. And I still remember growing up in a Christian home, my dad would tell me, James, before you were born, we prayed for you to be a pastor. And I would say, no way will I ever be a pastor. And, and to be honest with you, I never wanted to be a pastor. This is the last thing I ever wanted to do. I wanted to join the Marines. I, I wanted to be an archaeologist. I wanted to be a, and in third grade, wrote a letter. Or, you know, when you have a, when you're in class, you write down your, what do you want to be when you grow up, essay. And I said, I wanted to be a NBA basketball player. And I still do in my dreams. <laughs> Go Warriors, by the way, right? Champions. <laughs> and... And so as, as time went by, and I've, I was been presented different challenges, and I really had to respond. I still remember moving here in the United States, and the challenge was learning a language that I hardly knew. I knew about it. I knew how to speak a little bit, but in terms of understanding the whole language, it was difficult. So that was a challenge for me, and a new culture. So I either had to adapt and learn the new culture here, or, or stay negative, or not even want to adapt and continue to be just um, you know, just continue to be so Filipino in my own culture that I don't adapt to becoming an American Filipino Filipino American and I still remember how in college I struggled with my faith I struggled in following God and there was a challenge presented to me by God himself to either give my life to Him, totally surrender my life to Him, or continue on my path of wanting to do things on my own, wanting to fulfill myself, wanting my dreams, that it was about me. And I still remember when I was at a youth camp where my dad asked me to, to go be a youth counselor. And to be honest with you, I was the last person you should ask to be a youth counselor at that time because I, no, I was not fit to be one. I was... I didn't have a good life. I did not walk with God. But God used me anyways and challenged me. And, and the beautiful thing about God is that He pursues us. He never gives up, gives up on us. He continues to pursue us and gives us that challenge to respond. And we will either respond in not being obedient to His call or we will respond in obeying him, Gary. And I still remember that night, I was crying, I was crying out for him, and he spoke to me in a, in a way that I can't explain, and called me to surrender my whole life, my dreams, everything. And that night I decided to serve him in ministry. This morning, you will be given a challenge by God, I believe. And maybe he's been working with you already this past several Sundays that we've been going to our discipleship series. But we've learned throughout our series that God is working. That yes, he calls us to discipleship and gives us a mission to go and make disciples of all nations. And that doing this is not easy. But remember that it's not our own strength that, that allows us to accomplish this call to discipleship and this call to go and make disciples. But that God is working in you and through you. That it is through Christ that we're able to really accomplish this call. And that He's been preparing your hearts. He's been preparing the hearts of the people here in San Francisco that we're going to meet. Maybe at our, our work, maybe at school that He will give us an opportunity to share who Christ is. Not only is He at work, but God has called us to become His laborers, to become His fishermen for men and women and children. You see, following Christ is not just going to church, it's not, it's not just receiving eternal life. That's amazing, yes. But He calls us to a greater purpose, to love Him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And loving your neighbor as yourselves is sharing about Jesus, is making disciples of all nations. You see, 
He calls us to discipleship. And discipleship is living every day in faith in God, following Him, learning Him, learning about Him more and more each day. Not just learning about who He is, that He died for you, but knowing that He is a great high God who desires to give you purpose, desire to empower you for His kingdom, desires to use you for His glory. And that he really wants you to join his kingdom movement here in the city and where you're from. For he is moving. Not only is God at work, he's called us. He's called you specifically. He knows who you are. He knows what you've been through. He knows your past. He knows your pains. He knows your hopes and dreams. And he's calling you. to a life of discipleship. He's calling you to give you hope and to give you this mission. And that mission, and we talked about it last week in terms of our mission, is to go and make disciples of all nations. And that we've learned that following Christ and being a Christian is not just about going to church and sitting on, on those chairs, but to go and make disciples. Because when we go and make disciples and join where God is working, we're able to experience Him more in our lives. We're able to see the miracles that we read about in Scripture. We're able to understand and, and learn of who the Holy Spirit that's living in us, for the Holy Spirit is God in us. And we're able to partake of the great, amazing stories of people coming to know Christ being transformed by the gospel, being changed from their old life to a new life in Him. This morning, what is our response as we close? We have this great, we've been given this great responsibility. Yes, I'm not going to downplay that. It is a great responsibility. For it is given by God. Not by man, not by some deity. It's by God, the true God, the living God. And He's been given us this responsibility to discipleship and to make disciples of all nations. And so as we face this challenge and this obstacle, our culture goes against this challenge and this call. Our culture calls us to love ourselves, to be comfortable, to, to, to think about me. And when we look at Jesus' teaching, it goes against what our culture teaches. Jesus teaches us to lose our life for His sake. Our culture teaches us to pick your, I mean, to, to choose your life, to prosper your life, that, to, to, to gain wealth and happiness. But Jesus calls us to lose our life, to love our enemies, to give glory not to ourselves, but to God alone. To walk by faith and not by sight. Even our Christian culture, if we're honest with ourselves in this country, has left us with difficult challenges in responding to God's call of discipleship and making disciples. Because our culture, our Christian culture, calls us and encourages us to, to live comfortably, to go to church. And that's all, that, and to be good. And to, 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 not, to not go out of your comfort zone and radically follow Christ. This morning, what is our response to God? What is our response as a church in Jefez SF? Because yes, this is a series, and I don't want it to become the any other series where after this series is done, we go home and we forget about what we have learned from God's Word. Because this call to discipleship and to go and make disciples of all nations will be the same call that God's going to call you next month. It's never going to change. God calls us to discipleship and to go make disciples. That's never going to change. The Great Commission will never change. But what is our response? If we look at the book of Timothy this morning in 2 Timothy chapter 4, the Bible tells a story about Apostle Paul's relationship with Timothy. Apostle Paul has been discipling Timothy. And at this time, Apostle Paul realizes that his time on earth 
is very, his time um, on earth is, is running out. He's in his second imprisonment in Rome for sharing the gospel. And there he gives Timothy, the one that he's been discipling, meaning showing how to follow God, teaching them and training him how to share the word, how to preach the word. He's giving him his final charge, a challenge. And here he did not inspire Timothy through empty well wishes like, you know, yeah, you know, you're going to have a great ministry. Ministry is not going to be that hard. No, he, he tells him straight. And he tells him that many people will not listen to the gospel. Many people will only desire what they want from the gospel, the good things, but not everything. And But he charges him that he must remain faithful in sharing the gospel, that he must remain faithful in following God in discipleship and making disciples of all nations. The background of 2 Timothy chapter, 2 Timothy, the book of the letter of 2 Timothy, and it's the second letter by Apostle Paul, is that he's writing this in Rome in his second imprisonment, and written around 64 to 65 AD. And this letter, if you ever read it, it's very personal. It's a personal letter to Timothy. Because Timothy is not only his disciple, but he's his close friend. They've shared intimate times together and sharing their struggles and their victories in, in following Christ. And Timothy is his co-laborer. And the theme of 2 Timothy is really is that Paul gives Timothy this bold and clear, again, charge to share the gospel despite suffering. Despite suffering. And so let's read 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. It says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead by his appearing in his kingdom. I charge you. Paul's charge to Timothy is issued in the presence of God in Christ Jesus. I mean, that's pretty bold. Here, Paul is giving Timothy this binding oath to ministry. But besides the magnitude of that binding oath and trust in God, Timothy, Paul really wanted to provide Timothy extra motivation. Not only is God calling us to continue the ministry and share the gospel, but here he's saying that Christ Jesus will judge the living and the dead. That we as Christians and non-Christians should have a healthy fear of the future, of God's judgment. Meaning that in the end, God will judge everyone. And so, because God will come one day, and, and or if we, die, when, if we die before Christ comes, we will be judged by God. And so Paul is basically telling Timothy, you need to continue to share the gospel, for God will judge all men and women one day. And that as Christians and unbelievers, this will happen to all of us. And so if judgment will happen to everyone, and we know as followers of Christ the outcome, if someone is not in Christ when judgment comes, we ought to tell people of this final judgment. And here, he really speaks that one day, as followers of Christ, we have to continue to remain faithful in loving and serving Him because as, as Christians, we have bound. And maybe we, you guys have, and I, I've never really thought about this before, maybe five years ago, I never really thought about this, that when I gave my life to Christ, that I've been bound to follow Him and faithfully obey His commands. It's not just some, yay, Jesus died for me at the cross, but there is this covenant, this agreement between me and God. 
to faithfully follow him and give my life to him and share the gospel. The second motivation that Paul says is that in verse 1, by his appearing in his kingdom. That yes, it has not happened yet, but Jesus Christ is coming back again. And it's an event that I believe we should all get excited about. Am I right? As Christians. That Christ is coming at any time. And we must be ready. I mean, imagine if Christ comes right now. No, I'm not kidding. If he comes right now, what would he say to us? What would you say to him? If he came up to you and said, Dimitri, how you doing? How you been being obedient to what I've called you to do? I mean, I would be afraid too, right? You see, that alone should give us extra motivation as followers of Christ to continue to respond to God's call in our lives. And in verse 2, this is a charge that Paul gives Timothy. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience in teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sec sound teaching, but have itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Paul says, preach the word. The Greek word for preach is kereso, kereso, which means to make known, to proclaim, to announce. So I'm not telling you that you have to be a preacher per se. But as followers of Christ, we are to make known. We are to announce to people we meet, to people we hang out with, to people we love, to people we don't love. Announce who Jesus is. And here, preach the word. What is that word, the word? Well, the word is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The word is sharing about the truth of who Jesus Christ is. That he is the savior of the world. That he is the one who humbled himself. Became 100% man, 100% God. Lived among humanity and died at the cross. So that we can be forgiven. So that our debts because of sin separates us from God. That we are able to be reconciled. We are able to have a relationship with God once again. Not because of what we have done, but because of what Christ has done at the cross. Preach the word. That's what Paul's charge to Timothy. When's a time in your life when you went out and just told something exciting about someone? I think of moments when I got engaged to my wife, Pia. I mean, I, we didn't have Facebook back then. We had MySpace and Friendster, and you probably don't know what that is. But I announced it. I told my friends. I, I you know, I, I called my, my relatives. I'm engaged. I'm engaged, right? I announced it. I proclaimed it. Or maybe when the Warriors won. I mean, everybody, even bandwagoners, right? Yes, I started liking them this year too. But everybody just started wanting, go Warriors, they're champions. They're proclaiming it down the street. I mean, everybody was so nice to each other last week and saying, hey, go Warriors, go Warriors, champs. Finally, after how many years, Joel? 45 years, right? Or, or when you got married, right? Or maybe when someone's hurt, when someone is really hurt, and you would say, call 911, there's a fire, call 911, that person got hit by a car, right? You proclaim and you announce it, because there's urgency, or there's excitement about this announcement. Now, in terms of our charge to preach the word, are we excited about it? Is there urgency? In, our, in us that, that wants to share to our neighbor the love of God? Is there excitement where you have to tell your best friend about Jesus or your grandma 
or your coworker. You see, if we can be excited about saying, go Warriors, we could be so ecstatic about your engagement or you finding the love of your life. Why can't, be, why can't we be more excited and ecstatic about sharing the greatest thing in the world, the greatest truth, the greatest love in the world, Jesus Christ, to someone we know? We have to have that same passion and even more. And that's why Paul didn't care about himself and, and really wanted Timothy to see that, that it was for Christ and all about Christ. Now that we've learned that God calls us to preach the word, let's take a closer look to when we preach the word. And in verse 2, it says, when do we preach the word? It says, be ready in season and out of season. We are to proclaim the word when? During Easter time only? During evangelism focus month on at Interface SF? When it's your birthday? During Christmas? No. It says we have to be ready to preach the word in season or out of season. Meaning that we do it at any time, any place, anywhere. And here, the pastor or community group leader, the treasurer or worship leader are not the only one that's supposed to share the word and preach it. We have been given this charge for all believers to go and make disciples of all nations. And so we have to continue to sh preach the word every day because can you pause you being saved in, in, in Christ? Can you say, you know what, I, I don't feel like being saved and having eternal life today. No, Jesus doesn't pause your forgiveness. He doesn't say, you know, Ryan, today I'm not going to forgive you. No, he forgives you no matter what. No matter when we make mistakes, he still forgives you. His love is everlasting. His grace continues and abounds every day. If Christ's love and his sacrifice at the cross is everlasting, then our willingness to walk by faith and follow Him every day should be the same. Because in truth, we have been given freedom. And this, the life we have here on earth is just for a moment that we will spend eternity in God, in heaven, and rejoicing with Him. A preacher once said this, that our time on earth is just so tiny in terms compares to our eternal life in heaven. And so our time here is so short that we don't have that much time to, I mean, in terms of our, in terms of time of being able to partake in sharing the gospel. It's really not facing that long. judgment. And King Agrippa asked him, you know, why don't you speak of, of your defense? And so Paul stands there in front of a whole crowd and begins to tell his story of who he is, where he came from. That he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, that he, he studied the Old Testament and was, was a zealot Pharisee, knew scripture. And that he persecuted Christians, even made the charge to kill Christians. But one day as he was walking on the Damascus Road looking for Christians to persecute, he encountered Jesus Christ. You see, Apostle Paul was in an inconvenient situation. He was in jail, right, being judged. He could have easily said, you know what, I am tired, God. I don't want to share my story. These people hate me. They've beaten me. My family's rejected me. I've lost merit in the community. I've lost status. But no, he didn't think about that. He was ready to preach the word in season and out of season. In convenient times and convenient times. And here he was able to share the gospel in his story. In his transformational story. How he encountered Jesus Christ on the Damascus Road. Blinded him. And gave him a great purpose to go and share the gospel to the Gentiles. This morning, we will be put 
Maybe next week, next month, tomorrow, in situations where, yes, it may be inconvenient to share about Jesus. Or maybe it's easy because you're just hanging out with your friend at the coffee shop. But we must be ready. We must not be unashamed. We, will not, we must not be ashamed of who Jesus is. Now that we've learned that we've called, we are called to preach the word and to be ready in season and out of season, as we close, let's take a closer look at how proclaiming the word is done effectively. In verse 2 still, and I'll read, Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Sharing the gospel in season and out of season is done effectively by correction, by rebuke, by encouraging someone with great patience and careful instruction. What that looks like basically is that as we share the word of God to some individual, we're going to have situations where it's going to be practical for us. Meaning that as you share the gospel to uh, a person, you are going to try to convince that person. Correction is really convincing that person of his dire need of forgiveness. That without Christ, sin has left him bankrupt. Sin has left him to be judged by God, by a holy, righteous God. And sin has separated him from God. And so when we meet someone, when we correct someone, we do it in patience. We share the urgency of he, of her, and his need to know about the truth, about his dire need of forgiveness. Not only that, we walk alongside this person and guide him or her to obedience, to continue to be obedient to God's word and follow Christ. And so to rebuke really means to warn that person, saying, hey, you have to change this lifestyle that you're on. Because if you don't change, there's consequences in terms of that lifestyle. Because sin has consequences. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not a Christian. Sin will give birth to consequences. And ultimately, if you're not a believer, sin will give birth to death. And here, if we rebuke someone or warn someone, we do it because we love them. We do it because we truly care about them. Because if we don't rebuke someone about being obedient to God's word, then we don't truly love that person. Because we're just letting him walk towards that road where it leads to destruction. It leads to hurt, pain. And the second part, the third part, is to encourage. It means to exhort, to give courage for that person. To walk by faith, Gary. And to give, to really walk alongside them. And that's what's so amazing about following Christ. Because Christ, once, he, once we understand who He is, once we give our life to Him, He walks alongside us. He never leads us or not forsakes us. He continues to be our shepherd. He continues to be our true Father in Father's Day today. He is our true Father. And here... As we encourage, that's a picture of discipleship. You see, when we are able, when, if we are able to effectively preach the word in season, out of season, is to walk someone in discipleship. Not only do we share the truth about Jesus, but we walk with them in discipleship. We don't just say, hey, give your life to Jesus, look at that church, go to that church, I'll see you later. That's not how Jesus did it. He picked 12 men and said, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And he asked them to walk with him daily. He asked them to live with them. He asked to eat with them, pray with them. See, Christianity is about discipleship. It's painted all over scripture when you look at it. There is discipleship. This morning as I close, what is our response? There's a huge, great, it's, it's, it's a great responsibility. It is. But as we have learned about who God is and that He's called us to this opportunity, He is working. 
that it is his call in our lives, that, he, that, that it's not what we ever doing, but God is calling us. And that he's called us to discipleship and given us a great mission. What is our response this morning?